Welcome to the seventh video in the Technician Exam Preparation course. In this video, I'll discuss all about getting on the air and making contacts using your Technician Class License Privileges. Ham radio contacts are all about having a conversation. In ham speak, it's called having a QSO or QSO. If I wanted to have a QSO with Roger Redmond, call sign KE7AFB, I'd key my radio by pushing the push to talk button and say, Kilo Echo 7, Alpha, Bra Alpha Foxtrot Bravo, this is Kilo 7 Oscar Juliet Lima calling. Then I'd release the push to talk and wait for him to answer. When he does answer, he'd probably say something like, K7OJL, this is KE7AFB, go ahead and we'd have the conversation. At the end, I'd probably say something like, KE7AFB, this is K7OJL, and I'm clear. He'd also respond in similar fashion. And with that, we followed the identification rules. Identify every 10 minutes and at the end of a conversation. Always listen for a while before transmitting. When communicating over a repeater, you can usually hear both sides of a QSO. Operating simplex, however, may mean that you can only reliably hear one side of the conversation. So listening for a little bit before transmitting is not only a good idea, it's the right thing to do. You may be having a conversation on a repeater at a time when a regularly scheduled net is supposed to start. I'll talk about nets in, the, in a future presentation. And if possible, be accommodating and move off the frequency. Picket fencing is a good description of how some signals sound when the transmitter is moving through an area of high buildings. The signal is blocked for a brief moment, then comes back, then is blocked, and so on. If someone tells you that you are picket fencing, you probably need to defer the contact until you have a better line of sight to the repeater. Amateur radio uses a lot of abbreviations called Q codes. They come from the early days of telegraphy when abbreviations made sending messages much faster. On this slide are a number of common Q codes and abbreviations. The ones highlighted are potential test questions, CQ, QRM, and QSY. As an aside, when looking for a contact on a repeater, the common practice is not to call CQ, but to announce your call sign and say that you're listening or that you're monitoring. Sometimes I'll hear people give their call sign and ask for a signal report as a means of making contact. You should always assume that someone is listening, even though they may not answer. How do amateur radio operators tell others where they are located? They give their maidenhead grid square. The map on the slide shows the grid squares for the United States. The whole world is mapped into grid squares. We are in grid square DN30 in most of Tuella County, that's DN30. And that leads me to the topic of radio sport. As with all hobbies, there are ways to have contests and challenges in amateur radio. I enjoy these radio sports and participate as often as I can. Most of these contests have to do with making as many contacts as defined by the rules as possible in a specific period of time. For instance, every year on the last weekend in October is one of the largest and very popular C2 Worldwide DX Single Sideband Contest. The object is to make as many contacts worldwide as possible on that weekend using single sideband. As a technician class license holder, you have single sideband privileges on 10 meters. Even in these low sunspot, sunspot times, foreign contacts are still happening on 10 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeter sideband. Single sideband is quite popular on these bands and impressive scores have been made. Fox hunts, also known as hidden transmitter hunts, 
are also very popular. You don't need to have a license. When participating in a fox hunt, you're listening to the radio, and there's no need to transmit. We have a trip planned for late summer to Europe, and you want to know if you can use your radio while you're there. The answer is, yeah, yes. It's also yes in many other parts of the world. The U.S. has agreements in place with most countries. If you have a question about operating in a specific country, you can find the information on the ARRL website, ARRL.org. Many countries have license classes similar to the technician, general, and amateur extra classes we have in the U.S., but they have different names. You should know, however, and understand that technician class license holders from the U.S. generally have limited ability for operations in foreign countries. And it's usually just limited to repeaters. Note the paragraph under the map. This is a test question that seems to show up quite often. The key to this question is the words documented or registered in the United States. This concludes video session seven. I've talked in this video about common operating practices, some of the amateur radio lingo, grid squares, radio sports, and operating in foreign countries. Note any questions or concerns you have so we can discuss them in the weekly online meeting. You can also email them to me at rollingcasemyth at gmail.com.